welcome back forum. Great to have your company once again. Here's my latest interview from bbsradio.com, an interview with former Black Panther Larry Pinkney. And he's a, a political commentator and a very well-respected man who knows a thing or two about what's happening with our political system. In this interview, he exposes the war criminal Obama, the drone king. Here we go with a fascinating interview. Hope you enjoy this just as much as I do. Welcome back, everybody, to the People Speak Radio Show. I'm your host for tonight, Steve Johnson. The People Speak Show normally airs every Tuesday from 6 to 7 Pacific and 9 to 10 p.m. Eastern on the BBS Radio Network. You can participate during the show with call-in questions for our guests toll-free in the United States and Canada on 1-888-429-5471. That number again, 1-888-429-5471. Well, this is a fantastic show tonight. We're talking to a very special guest here, a regular guest on the long-running radio show hosted by Phil Restino called United We Strike. He's a well-known American researcher, a prolific writer, an outspoken advocate of human rights, and a renowned political commentator. We're talking tonight to Mr. Larry Pinckney about the political ties and machinations surrounding the Obama administration and its implications for the people of America. Welcome to the People Speak Radio Show, Mr. Pinckney, sir. Thank you. It is an honor and a delight to be on the People Speak Radio Show. Thank you, my brother. Well, thank you, sir. The honor is truly all ours. Uh, we'll be taking audience questions after the first half hour, but my first question to you, Mr. Pinckney, is, is how long have you been fighting for human rights in America, and how did you get started? Well, I got started at the age of, uh, hmm, I guess I was 11 or 12 years old when I had the opportunity to meet uh, Brother Malcolm X uh, in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, and even though I was extremely young, I read a lot and studied a lot. And uh, this brother touched my heart. Uh, and uh, years later, approximately, oh, five or six years later, I found myself in California and ultimately became a section leader in the Black Panther Party. So, you know, people do have an impact. They definitely do, and I guess that's how I was started. And let me just say, I've been in the struggle now, the people's struggle, uh, and, and I love being on the People Speak Radio, the people's struggle for well over 47 years. The struggle continues. Wow, so you're a long-termer at this sort of thing. Well, <laughs> that's one way of putting it. Absolutely, absolutely, my brother. Uh, you are indeed the only American ever to have successfully self-authored your own civil and political rights case to the United Nations under International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Can you elaborate on the significance of that and what it means for everyday people who are having their rights abused today? What it means, uh, frankly, is that there is international legal pre precedent. Again, I repeat, international legal precedent uh, that addresses quite frankly, uh, matters relating to human rights. And, and people, unfortunately, especially in the United States, are not cognizant of this. They don't understand simply because the corporate government, if you will, uh, has done a, a, a horrible or good, however you want to put it, job of keeping that information away from people. My case, yes, I self-authored it. I did not go through a lawyer. Everyone, or virtually everyone, told me, you're crazy. Uh, your case will never be accepted by the UN. Well, I remembered what Brother Malcolm had said to me well over a decade earlier. And he said, you know what? The struggle uh, for human rights is an international struggle. So we need to take it internationally. So I'm, I'm honored, I'm delighted uh, that I, I, I did that. And even though, of course, I ultimately won, in quotation marks, in other words, I received a ruling from the United Nations Human Rights uh, Committee, which consisted, consisted of many, many countries, uh, stating that indeed my human rights had been violated, both the U.S. and Canada simply ignored uh, the decision. But other countries around the world, uh, whether it was in France, Denmark, Germany, Ghana, Tanzania, uh, Jamaica, Ghana, etc., etc. I think I mentioned Ghana before. But the point is that I'm making is that countries and peoples around the world understood the significance of that for everyday ordinary people. 
You don't have to be a lawyer to know anything about human rights. And I want to make that clear. Mm. Uh, Your own personal fight for human rights across the board has seen you speak out, not only for your own rights and the rights of African Americans, but for the rights of indigenous Americans' rights also. How much work have you done with indigenous Americans in the past? Well, let me begin by saying that my grandmother, uh, my mother's mother, is indigenous. Right. And uh, I, I have a deep an abiding bond with uh, indigenous peoples, uh, particularly those in the so-called United States. I say so-called because, quite frankly, I hate that term Native American. It's like, excuse me, before Americo Vespucci was even born or even thought of being born, indigenous peoples uh, were all over the two continents that have become named North America and South America. Um, So so my point that I'm trying to make quickly is that uh, indigenous people uh, and myself, and I consider myself not only a quote-unquote black American, but I'm very proud to be, uh, to have the blood in my veins of indigenous native people. And no, I did not say Native American, because those people, our people, existed long before there was any such thing called America. Absolutely. Very, very good point there. You know, in Australia, they call the indigenous people, uh, they call them aboriginals, but I deny that term. I don't think they're aboriginals. I think they are the originals. Mm, mm. I like that, brother. That's a, I like that. Yeah, they, they've, they've got us brainwashed that they're not the originals by saying the word aboriginals. Mm, very good point. I love it. Because, you know, we need to be critical thinkers. We need to understand that these terms and terminology, the narrative is a narrative meant to control and to define how we think for those few of us who, in fact, are still thinking. But I think it's Mm -hmm. increasing. More and more people are finally beginning to think. But I love what you just said. It makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. You know, in the past, you've written a lot of a lot of massive uh, articles on government treason against the people. As an associate editor on the IntrepidReport.com, as well as the Black Commentator, what kind of support and responses have you gotten from your work over the years? Well, initially, back, uh, you know, let's go back to 2007, 2008. It's now 2015. But let's go back uh, a few years. You know, the responses overwhelmingly were positive because people were shocked that I dared to write the truth, the truth about uh, the Obamatron, that is to say, Mr. Hope and Change, who was really Mr. Rope and Change, (laughs) not Hope. All right. I mean, really, let's be honest. And I went into who this character really is, who he really serves. And uh, the responses I got overwhelmingly were positive. Of course, I got some responses uh, from readers that said, how dare you? How could you how could you tell the truth? Well, they didn't say tell the truth. How could you give this information about that brother? Well, my brothers and my sisters are those on Mother Earth who are the stewards of this planet. They are not those who are bloodsuckers. So I don't judge people based on their pigmentation, or what I call the pigmentoid mentality. Right. So I, I got a number of responses, but I just wanted to be very succinct and let you know. Most of the responses were extremely positive. People were shocked that even back in 07 and 08, I was speaking truth to power. Awesome. You know, talking about the rope and chains guy, I, I prefer to call him the, the drone king, Barry Satoro. Uh, he, prom- yes. he promised us all hope and change and gave us nothing more than disillusion and dismay. Why is it that people fall for the same promises every time of these corporate-backed professional liars? Well, the fact of the matter is, is that the corporations control uh, not only the White House and the Congress, But let us also understand they control the so-called media. I call it the corporate stream vomit stream media. So what uh, the people get, black, white, brown, red, and yellow, what everyday ordinary struggling people get on a daily, hourly basis 
is vomit. And I don't mean to be offensive uh, to the audience. And by the way, I want to thank the audience around the world for listening to this uh, wonderful program but or, or show. But the fact of the matter is that, you know, we're fed a diet constantly of vomit. And so people go for the ghosts, as we used to say back in the late 60s and early 70s. We need to stop going for the ghosts and start going for our own humanity collectively. As a collective, as a group collective, do this. I once heard you say in an interview that change does not come from comfortable people. Change actually comes from uncomfortable people. Do you think there are currently enough uncomfortable people in America? Well, to be blunt, I'm not sure, but I know it's rapidly growing. And I think the time is approaching very quickly when indeed there will be enough uncomfortable people. And I'm not just talking about uncomfortable in physical terms. That's, of course, important. But I'm also talking about, that's why I said earlier, we must be critical thinkers. I'm also talking about being uncomfortable as being uh, what I call intellectual stooges, intellectual dupes. Mm -hmm. I think more and more people are saying, hey, we're not going to accept this psychologically, intellectually, or physically. So it's happening. We don't see it, and we shouldn't, ex or some of us may not see it. We shouldn't expect to find it on ABC, NBC, CBS, BBC, CBC, or any of the rest of them. This is about the people, everyday, ordinary, struggling, black, white, brown, red, and yellow people on our very precious Mother Earth. You know, it's, it's staggering for me to realize that, that in America, the amount of homeless people, approximately 22 million, it, it equates to the same number of total people in the total population of Australia. That's how many people mm -hmm. don't have a home tonight. And you know what? You know what that is, my brother? That is criminal. That is criminal. There's no other word to describe it but criminal. We need another Nuremberg trial. We need we the people. We need a people's trial. A people, a, a trial of, by, and for the people. Amen. What you just said is utterly unacceptable. Utterly unacceptable. But we the people, everyday, ordinary, black, white, brown, red, and yellow people, we are the only ones who can change it. And we will change it. That's certainly one example amongst many that the government simply are not doing their job. They're not doing what they're supposed to be paid to do, to look after and to govern the, the, uh, the resources of the people. Right, right. Well, unfortunately, their definition of their job differs immensely from the definition of the, the founding uh, fathers and mothers, okay? Now, that's not to say that this country, the United States, did not make many mistakes even in its foundation. It did. However, there is a big difference between the so-called ideals, that's I-D-E-A-L-S, ideals of this country as expressed by these lying, hypocritical leaders of all colors and both genders, and they're not leaders, in fact, they're misleaders, okay? There's a big difference between that and the reality of these bloodsuckers of what they're doing to the overwhelming majority, not just the majority, but the overwhelming majority of mm. people, not only in the United States or Canada or Australia, but quite frankly, around the globe throughout Mother Earth. Yes, sir. Uh, now, government aside, do you honestly think that the corporations are greatly to blame for the current state of affairs of the nation? I think the corporations control the nation. Right. I think the corporations control the government. So, uh, to be blunt, absolutely. Absolutely. You, you think of corporations, I'm going to use one example. Monsanto, that blood-sucking piece of manure. <laughs> All right? Uh, 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 you know, Cargill, another blood-sucking piece of manure. Lockheed, another blood-sucking piece of manure. I mean, it's an endless list. As Gil Scott Heron would oh, yeah. say, that won't be missed. Yeah, Northrop Grunman, Goldman Sachs, Citibank, J.P. Morgan. Right, right, right. I mean, it's, it's endless. But you know what? We, the people, black, white, brown, red, and yellow, 
it is time for us to wake the heck up and understand that the only people who can change this and who will change this are we ourselves. Stop depending on these avaricious, blood-sucking, hypocritical so-and-sos. I'm trying not to curse. I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> okay. Uh, 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 to, to, to do anything for us. They are about themselves. They always have been. And it is time for them to be totally and fundamentally dislodged. And it's quite possible too many people are standing back waiting for somebody else to take a stand and take the reins and do something about it. Yeah, unfortunately. It's sort of like, you know, back in the day, you know, I'm, I'm kind of an old guy. Don't get that confused. I might be an old guy, but I'm not elderly. Yes, sir. But back in the day, uh, you know, you know, you get on the dance floor, right? And nobody wanted to get on the dance floor. They liked the music, so it took one couple to get out there on that dance floor. And then what happened? Woo! Bam! All the other couples. We can't wait. We can't sit back and wait for uh, this person or that person. This is not a me struggle. It's not a me struggle. It's a we struggle. Now, I've listened just recently to the very popular interview you did on InfoWars about a year ago, which has now over 230,000 views. Is it surprising for you to realize that you're uh, about the views that, that you're saying about being a human with empathy is having such a wide impact on so many people? Is that surprising? Shocking. <laughs> wow. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted. I am absolutely delighted. But I'm also quite, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm a bit surprised in one way. But in another way, I've always believed uh, that people recognize truth, irrespective of their so-called ideologies, their so-called colors and gender. I think people do recognize truth, and I'm very, very glad that it's over 230,000, and it's growing. Mm. So, yes. I believe you've traveled around the world in your time. What are the, some of the countries you visited, and what's probably your most favorite country of all? Well... I'm going to have to just be blunt and tell you my favorite country of all. Uh, well, first, I'll tell you some of the countries. But I'll answer your question. Egypt, North Africa, Tanzania, East Africa, Uganda, East Africa, Zambia, Southern Africa, uh, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, obviously Europe. Um, but I've got to tell you, honestly, my favorite country is Ireland. Wow. I love the people of Ireland. I love the people of Mother Earth, no matter what country, but I got to tell you that when I was in Ireland, my God, the people were so, uh, now this was a few years ago, were so educated in terms, I didn't say brainwash, I said educated, big difference. So that's my favorite country, but you know, if there's any such thing, but I love the people throughout Mother Earth of all countries. Do you refer to educated as being politically aware? Yes, I do. Right. Yes, I do. Absolutely. I do believe that uh, I've heard you refer to America before in one of your interviews as Babylon. That's a very rasta term to describe the economic slavery we're currently under. Do you feel that we are in the ancient system of Babylon, just re-envisited uh, for, for the modern age? We are indeed. In fact, in some respects, it's far worse. How so? Because this Babylon has stretched its tentacles throughout the entire globe. The original Babylon was limited in the areas around Mesopotamia and other areas, but limited, limited. But this Babylon, oh my goodness. And so, yes, uh, it's, it's, it's time to dislodge the, 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 the Babylonians who are running this insane asylum. And you know what? We can do it. So yes, I'd have to say, yes, yes, yes. This is Babylon. What is your personal opinion about 9-11? Do you believe that 19 Muslim hijackers with box cutters could have done that? I believe that that's the biggest comedy I've ever seen. It's sad that people who are supposed to be intelligent could actually believe such a big lie. But as... Uh, what was his name? The uh, uh, Nazi 
who said the, the bigger the lie, the minister of propaganda, I believe it was Goebbels. Yes, sir, Joseph uh, Goebbels. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, it's time for us to understand that the lies that Obama, G.W. Bush, Democrats, Republicans, the bigger the lie, the more they think people will understand, will, will go for the ghost. But I'm telling you here today, all of us, that the bigger the lie, the easier it will be to pop the bubble like a balloon. It's a balloon. Get out your pens, folks, and pop the bubble, and let's create a more humane, a more honest society, not only in this country, but for our Mother Earth. So, so who in your mind do you think were the masterminds, the real masterminds of 9-11? Was it the Project for the New American Century? Was it Mossad? Was it Larry Silverstein, Dick Cheney, or all of the above? I think it was all of the above. Oh. Certainly, all of the above were cognizant of it. Certainly, all of the above were cognizant of it. I mean, ask yourself, why did the United States Air Force recall its fighter jet, all right? They actually recalled their fighter jets that were trying, that were there to intercept the passenger planes and, you know, may God rest the soul of the people who were on the, the souls of the people who were on that plane. But the, of those planes, not one plane, but a number of planes, United Airlines, American Airlines, planes, passenger planes. Yes. Of course they were, they were cognizant. Of course they were uh, uh, involved either directly or indirectly. Right. And it is time for us to stop fooling ourselves. You know, wake up, smell the roses, and let's plant some more roses by being critical thinkers and saying no more to this insanity. How about the chimpanzee in charge, Baby Bush? Do you think he was too brain dead to have played his role convincingly? Well, I certainly was not convinced, and I think uh, a number of <laughs> interesting <laughs> chimpanzee. Hmm. I think that's a bit of an insult to chimpanzees. But anyway, oh, my apologies. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I had to throw that in. <laughs> but I, 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 I think that uh, the reality is that you know it wasn't uh, uh, only that jerk, G. W. Bush. Uh, and by the way, Barack Obama has has extended the Bush policies, and not only extended, but he has exacerbated mm. the Bush policy. But I, I, I think that more and more, and I keep going back to this point, I believe that in the year 2015, we're going to see more and more, we're already seeing people of all colors, of both genders, and of all ages waking up. So, uh, you know, all I can say is what the French would say to G.W. Bush, and quite frankly, uh, Mr. Hope and Change Drone Man Obama. Yes, Drone Man. He murders by drones, not to mention his personal kill list. All I can say to them is, goodbye, c'est la vie, as they say in French, I believe. C'est la vie. Gone. Be gone. Be gone and good riddance. Amen. Do you think the fact that uh, the Drone King Obama, uh, he actually got a Nobel Prize, a Nobel Peace Prize, do you think that's a, 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 a very clear sign that the whole thing is rigged? I think it's a very clear sign of just how uh, hypocritical. Uh, yes, to first, let me answer your question. Of course it's rigged. I mean, to put it mildly, that's being very diplomatic. Of course it's rigged. Uh, um, but a, a peace prize to, to, to drone man? Now, people can say, oh, but they didn't know. Well, if they didn't know, why the hell did they award him the prize? Mm. I mean, it, 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 it doesn't make, it's not even logical, okay? It doesn't even begin to make any kind of common sense, or as my parents would say, that's not even horse sense. So that's my response to that, my brother. Wonderful. Uh, you are listening to the People Who Speak radio show. I am your host, Steve Johnson, talking with fascinating guest and special guest, Larry Pinckney, live on BBS Radio. We'll be back right back at, with our guest and audience questions after this short message break. <laughs> 
You're listening to the People Who Speak radio show coming to you live across America and across the world. I'm your host, Steve Johnson, and we're back with our guest tonight. He's a political analyst with his own website, www.blackactivistwg.org, and a prolific writer of the loss of liberties on such websites as blackcommentator.com. Welcome back there, Mr. Pinckney, sir. Thank you. As I said before, I am delighted. Thank you for having me to you and to the audience. Thank you. Well, I'm not only excited, but I'm having a fun time interviewing you. You're, you're certainly one of the uh, more passionate, more, more lovable characters that we've ever had. And uh, uh, we do have a, a caller. As I said, we go out live and direct. We've got a caller here from Ontario, Canada. We've got John. Are you there, John? I'm here. Go ahead, sir. Mr. Pinckney, ready and waiting for your question. Hello, Larry. Can you hear me okay? I can indeed, John. Great to hear you. Thank you. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, well, thank you for being here. And, uh, First of all, let me premise everything by saying that I, I agree with almost everything you say. I'm on your side 100% here. Um, now, I, I presume you know the story of Eddie Conway. Would that be correct? I not only know the story of Eddie Conway, I know Eddie Conway. I spoke to him about four days ago on the phone. But go ahead, yes. Okay, well, I found uh, the information that Eddie Conway exposed about the abuse of the FBI... Uh, and the judicial system that improperly imprisoned him for 44 years and the dehumanization that he was forced to endure during those years uh, is extremely enlightening, and i tell you why. Because the reality that you are up against, in my humble opinion, is a, uh, a white-dominated uh, world that does not understand the martial law state and tyranny that blacks have endured for decades. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, would you agree with that? I would agree with that with a caveat, but you go ahead and then I'll do my caveat. But yeah, uh, on principle, of course I would agree with that. Okay, so my frustration is that uh, I don't see the capacity of white America and white Canada, where I'm from, to understand that the tyranny that has been uh, levied against, the state tyranny, the judicial tyranny, the injustice that has been levied against uh, blacks, indigenous people, will eventually be uh, levied against uh, everybody else, including whites. Now, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Malcolm X said, there is no reforming empire. Mm -hmm. It has to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. Now, I appreciate your message about we've got to all get together, we've got to all fight this tyranny, and all the rest of it. My point to you is we are dealing with a, a, a population of white people that, first of all, don't give a goddamn, and mm -hmm. secondly, have no understanding of the state abuse that has been heaped on other people for decades and don't want to even engage in the conversation. Well, they may not I'll want leave you to respond, and I'll take. I'll listen to you off air. All right, John, and I thank you, brother. Thank you very much. Let me let me let me say this very quickly. Uh, number one, uh, I have to concur. I I, I am compelled to concur that uh, the overwhelming, or it appears that the overwhelming majority of so-called uh, whites, and I say so-called because well, it's another story. Anyway, uh, you know. Uh, are, are in denial. But I also want to remind you that there are also uh, a, a, an E, I don't even like the word elite. Let's just say that there is a certain segment of black uh, in the United States, for example, like Al Sharpton, like Jesse Jackson, who play this role of complicity, of complicity, you know, the uprisings that took place, the slave rebellions that took place were not only black slave rebellions. Let us remember John Brown. Let us remember his three sons who were hung, who were murdered at Harper's Ferry. Let us remember the Irish potato famine brought on by the terrible British Empire. Let us remember. Now, while I definitely agree with your uh, overall points, John, I want to emphasize that as we began the program, comfortable people do not make change. So maybe it's time for more and more people to become uncomfortable, which, by the way, includes white folk. But you know what? I love all my brothers and sisters 
And the more uncomfortable they become, the more I am going to be closely allied with them. And I trust in humanity, and I trust in Mother Earth. We have a question here, sir, from Reggie in Maryland. Larry, do you think they lied to us about Osama bin Laden just as they lied to us about Jessica Lynch and Pat Tillman? <laughs> I'm sorry for laughing. I don't, I don't mean, I mean no disrespect. But absolutely they lied to us. I mean, you know, our government, which is not our government at all, I put the word our in quotation marks, uh, is by its very nature, particularly in the last two to three decades, Particularly, it is by its very nature based on lies and deceit. Right. So there is no doubt that they have lied to us, not only about those things that you have mentioned, but so, so much more. Uh, we got a question from Mike in California. Do you think you could help Edward Snowden, Bradley Manning, and Julian Assange present their cases in front of the United Nations just as you did? Well, you know what? If, if asked to do so, I can tell you this, I would do my utmost for whatever it's worth uh, to, to be of assistance to those brothers. I would do my utmost. You know, my case was taken to the UN under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and I consider all of them to be heroes. And we've got some sheroes out there, too, now. Let us not forget. we got some sisters out there of all colors who are also standing up and fighting. So anything that I can do in terms of my own experience and background to be uh, uh, to, to aid those brothers and sisters, rest assured, that is precisely what I will do. We have a question from John in Canada. Mr. Pinckney, do you see personal debt as a form of slavery that prevents people from getting involved in social change? Well, I think that personal debt, first of all, let's define what personal debt is. In fact, let's take it to the baseline. What is debt? How is debt incurred? Who does debt come from? You know, let, let's be real. The bottom line is that debt is incurred thanks to this blood-sucking, avaricious system, uh, corporatism, corporate plutocracy, whatever blasted name you want to put on it. But you know, the debt is owed to the people, not the other way around, not the people owing debt to corporations or to governments. That's what I have to say about that, my brother. So it's manufactured debt that's uh, basically uh, part of the Babylon system. Of course, of course, what else? That's how, it, that's how the system functions. We have another call-in guest, uh, Mr. Cash in the United States. Are you there, Mr. Cash? I sure am. How are you? Go Good, ahead, Mr. Go ahead, sir. I mean, Stephen. How's everything going? Uh, my question is, what do you got to say to all these uh, people that are here in the United States trying to protect their Second Amendment rights, but all they're doing is sitting around and polishing their guns, waiting for the government to make the first move? Well, you know, the reality is the government has already made the first, second, and third move. And, you know, to me, uh, I was, uh, 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 Steve and I and w were talking earlier today. You know, and it, 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 I believe strongly in the right of self-defense, whether it's by a rock, uh, a stick, uh, words, uh, or whatever. I believe strongly in that. However, I believe that people need to do research. They need to understand that it's not a simple matter of gun. You know, it, it is a matter of, of awakening ourselves intellectually, mentally, psychologically. And so, I hope I'm making some semblance of sense in what I'm trying to, to get across. Um, I stand... Oh, absolutely. Go ahead. Go ahead. Abs absolutely. But what people don't realize is that they are killing us slowly with all different types of uh, weapons that they are using on us already, such as chemtrails and, uh, you know, harp system and things of different nature. Right. But uh, we're standing around and we're not defending ourselves. Well, the, you know... People will not defend themselves if they don't know they're under attack. Our job is to make sure that people understand clearly, clearly that they are under attack, that we collectively are under attack. The more we do that, 
the more we will see people awaken. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Cash. And, and you know, you, made a, you hit a very, very uh, sentient point there, Mr. Pinckney. We're not only under attack uh, psychologically, we're also under attack from the slow kill, from the poisons, from these chemical companies, from the food companies, from all this stuff that is poisoning our bodies and poisoning our genes for the, for the next generation. Right, right. And the fact of the matter is, it's going to get worse unless we stop it and then reverse it. We don't just need to stop it. We need to reverse it. We need to get people to understand that companies like Monsanto are monsters. They are monsters. And we need to break it down in very clear, simple, everyday, ordinary language of everyday ordinary people. That's what I consider myself, just an everyday ordinary person. That's what we need to do. There, we, we need to un make sure that people understand why we refer to them or why I refer to them as monsters, because that is precisely what they are and how it affects them. And we can do this. I believe strongly that we can do this. Uh, I have a question from Romero in New York. Uh, that recently on uh, Face of the Nation TV program, rioters began when out-of-towners came in and uh, were overheard saying, we're going to close this city down. What are your thoughts on the implications of an organized riot in a place like Baltimore or Ferguson? Well, first of all, I, I, I use the word rebellion, okay? Uh, if, if, if I go into uh, any place and there is nothing for me to stir up, all right. For example, I remember back in the 60s and 70s, they used to say, all these, these, these folks are stirring up trouble. But the fact of the matter is the trouble was already there. If, if there was no trouble already there, they couldn't stir it up. Right. But on the other hand, I do totally, or at least I hope totally uh, 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 understand or at least relate to the fact that there are certain, shall I say, elements such as the so-called New Black Panthers. And I notice I said so-called because they have nothing to do in reality with the original Black Panther Party mm -hmm. that go into places for the express purpose of causing as much uh, mayhem as they possibly can. I say right now, today, in 2015, as I said in 1967 and 1968, I say all power to the people. That means the people in their community, black, white, brown, red, and yellow. And, you know, it's one thing to, to say I am in support and solidarity with people who are struggling. But it's another thing to go in and to do anything and everything that you can uh, to exacerbate a situation that's already horrible. We have a question from Jane Bond in the United States. What are your thoughts on the modern-day Black Panther movement as compared to the original one? Well, I, I think I may have touched on that uh, just now. Uh, I, don't, I don't consider it a Black Panther movement. Oh. If you look at, uh, for example, the book uh, by Huey P. Newton, To Die for the People, uh, read it. You'll find out. Read it. I mean, actually read it, okay? Uh, you, you will see that, first of all, we were not racist. We were not anti-people. We were pro-people. And I cannot uh, uh, align myself with or associate with any organization of any color that says kill babies, kill white babies. Wow. No, excuse me. I can't go there. And there's an article I would encourage everyone to read. It's online. Just Google it. It's called Everybody Hate the new Black Panther Party. Everybody, just Google it, and I think that will summarize it. The so-called new Black Panthers, excuse me, <laughs> what the hell are they talking about? Do no, as, as, as if we don't still exist. The party was destroyed, but our legacy was never destroyed. Right. Do you, do you consider they may be co-intel pro to give the Black Panthers a bad name? Well, the bottom line is I have to look at their actions. And their actions tell me, I have to say, where are your, are your national uh, breakfast programs like the original Black Panther Party had? Where are your national food programs, your national school programs? Where are your programs for senior citizens? Where are your programs to educate the people? Where are your school programs where we had teachers, quote unquote, 
uh, uh, many of whom had degrees, some of whom didn't, but from the community. Where are your national programs? You know, the proof of the pudding is in the taste. Somebody can't come along and just grab a name. Oh, I'm a new Black Panther. Yes, yeah, sure you are. Mm-hmm. I, I do consider that this may be uh, some kind of uh, an operation to create social unrest. Did you concur with that? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the fact of the matter is, is that the uh, FBI called the, the original Black Panther Party the, the single number one internal threat uh, to the United States. And G. Edgar Hoover went further to say to, to state that it had nothing to do with guns. It had everything to do with the fact that the Black Panther Party was serving the people with Breakfast for Children program. They were serving the people. We were serving the people. We were winning the hearts and minds of the people. So we had to be decimated. You don't see that with the so-called new Black Panther Party, do you? So and you won't. The, the original group actually had policies that were in place and implemented to actually help people. That's right. And we had close alliances with uh, uh, white, brown, yellow, wow. and red people. Right. That, that needs to be understood. Close alliances, working, viable alliances. That needs to be clearly understood. So... You know, you make your own decision. Make your own decision. But for God's sake, check out history as it really was and is, not as this vomit that uh, uh, certain elements, I don't care what their color is, certain elements are feeding us today. Do you consider, in your opinion, that planet Earth today, in 2015, is just one big slave plantation? It absolutely is one big slave plantation, and it's time for a big one big slave revolt, one big slave rebellion. And this is what, you know, I remember the words of the Irish freedom fighter, Bobby Sands. Mm -hmm. And he said, our revenge will be the laughter of our children. Our revenge, I feel killed every time I say that. Our revenge will be the laughter of our children. And indeed, that's what this struggle is truly all about. Get off the plantation, physically, psychologically, intellectually. Get off of it. And we can do that. We've got to do that because we must survive. And the only reason or only way or fashion for us to survive is to make sure our precious Mother Earth survives. We are stewards of this planet. And so, yes, time to get rid of the plantations, all of them. And I don't care who they're supervised by, black, white, brown, red, or yellow. It is the overwhelming majority of black, white, brown, red, and yellow people who are under the boot. It's time for a real people's rebellion. The overlords are the parasites of this world, not the people. That's right. Now, how important is critical thinking for the people to engage in? How important is that? Critical thinking is an absolute necessity. Critical thinking is precisely what uh, this government and other governments, but particularly the U.S. government, does not want us to do. If you are a critical thinker, then you are questioning. And if you are questioning, you are considered an enemy of the state. All right? And who's the state? Why, they are the blood-sucking, avaricious pieces of manure that are controlling the corporate... Oh, I'm trying not to curse. Lord knows. <laughs> You're doing uh, very uh, well. You know, who, who, who are, are manipulating, playing us off against each other and keeping us in a state, a deliberate state of turmoil, confusion, and disunity. So we have got to understand that. It's not complicated. It's actually quite simple. Do you see much hope on the horizon as far as people waking up to what a scam is really going on in this world? I see lots of hope on the horizon. I see lots of hope, but not the kind of dope hope that Obama was talking about. Not the kind of dope hope, rope hope, chain hope. No, I see revolutionary hope. Mm. And when I say revolutionary hope, I am talking about critical people critically thinking questioning, being honest with each other. You know, we don't want robots. We don't need robots. That's what we're fighting against. We need people to be honest, forthright, and, and, and really work at bringing about systemic change, systemic 
change. And I do see hope, and it's deeper than hope. I see revolutionary hope. Wow. You know, uh, and, and, and yes, I absolutely, I, I'm sorry, I get a little fervent about that. Love Go ahead, it. brother. I love it, I love it. Um, the, the, talking about the uh, the drone king, Obama, he actually promised in one of his campaigns, in his initial campaign, he, he promised to close Guantanamo Bay. I believe that was seven, eight years ago, and it's still open. Uh, since coming into presidential office, instead of doing so, he signed in the Indefinite Detention Act for Americans, the NDAA. What are your thoughts on mm -hmm. such actions? I think that it's, again, I'm going to go back to what I said earlier about something else uh, that, that, that this blood-sucking war criminal did. And by the way, Obama is a war criminal, and I would uh, remind everyone to read Cindy Sheehan's latest book called The Obama Files, Chronicles of an Award-Winning War Criminal by Cindy Sheehan. The Obama Files, Chronicles of an Award-Winning War Criminal. Now, getting back to what you said, the fact of the matter is, is that had we done our homework collectively, we would have known that the best thing Obama could do was to do what? Lie, lie, and then lie some more. Obama is a liar. You know, if you just look at what the, 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 this creature says, virtually everything he says, reverse it, and you'll have the truth. So that's what I have to say about that. And I'm, again, trying to remain diplomatic. I hope I'm diplomatic. Absolutely. Uh, you're talking about Cindy Sheehan's book, which is fascinating, called The Obama Files. I'm halfway through reading it at the moment myself. Uh, can you tell me, oh. how did you get to do the, uh, the foreword for, for that, such a book? Well, quite frankly, <laughs> it's a good question. All I know is that Cindy contacted me, and, and I, I am just so honored, so delighted. I, I, there are no words for how, how, how humbled I am, frankly. Uh, Cindy contacted me and asked me, uh, obviously before the book was written, if, if I would be willing to write the foreword. Of course, I got back to her and said, sister, are you kidding? Absolutely. Wow. So she contacted me and I did it. Can you tell the audience listening in and uh, listening in through the radio all around the world, can you tell us what was your most memorable experience over the years in the work you have done thus far? Oh my God. Now that's a very hard question, my brother. Uh, my most memorable experience? Wow. I'm, 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 I'm not really sure. I, I can name a couple. One would be uh, when, obviously, when, when uh, I, I took the case and actually to the UN and, and received uh, 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 the UN ruling in my favor. But because that affected not just me. In fact, the United States and Canada ignored it, but it affected and hopefully helped thousands of people, be they prisoners or, or non-prisoners alike around the world. I guess another experience was um, when I, this was just a few years ago, I happened to be in a store, uh, uh, and, and uh, Office Max, I believe it's called, it's like Kinko, but Office Max. And this white woman walked up to me, and she said, Larry, I'm going, uh-oh, another setup, what's happening here? Right. And I said, she says, are you Larry Pinkney? I said, yes. And she said, and she gave me her name. And I said, OK. And she said, uh, I'm from Oakland, California. This is what she said to me. She said, I know you don't remember me, but I was one of those kids that you fed in the breakfast program. Wow. I broke out in tears. I mean, I was I was in tears. I tried to hold them back. But when I got in the parking lot, the tears just flowed. Uh -huh. So I guess that would be. Uh, one of the most memorable experiences, I guess the other, another one would be when, when I was in prison, uh, uh, you know, uh, blacks, white, brown folk who were just murdering each other, of course, is what the, uh, the prison administration wanted them to do. And uh, a, a member of the so-called Aryan Brotherhood came up to me. Now, this, we're talking about the AB, the Aryan Brotherhood, came up to me, and this is in prison, and said to me, would, would I defend him? Uh, in what was called Warden's Court. And, uh, you know, uh, many of my black brothers said, well, you're not going to do that, are you? And I said, you're damn right I'm going to do that because he's being moved on just like you're being moved on. Don't expect love. This is not about love. This is about understanding who our common enemy is. By the way, we went to Warden's Court. We won! <laughs> uh and I acted as his advocate. This was in the California prison system. And, of course, the first thing the idiots did after we won was threw me uh, into solitary confinement. And for 
one of the first times in California history the murders stopped in that prison, and it was a prison of over 3,000, where black, white, brown, red, yellow people stopped it. They stopped it. Wow. And uh, that is an experience I shall never, ever forget. Do mm -hmm. you support, Mr. Larry Pinkney, do you support the stop funding of Israel? Absolutely. I mean, that's like asking me, do I support the stop funding of, 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 of Nazis? Of course I support the stop funding of Israel. Uh, you know, they unfortunately, uh, the, the, when I say they, I'm talking about the state of Israel. Yes. The Zionist state of Israel. Uh, they must be defunded, totally, unequivocally defunded. You know, and at least one fifth, if not more, of every dollar, U.S. dollar, goes to Israel. This is insane. And, and, and it is unacceptable. And that is, of course, nothing to do with any type of people or any religion at all. You're talking about the political Zionist movement that controls that country. That is absolutely correct, and we need to be clear about that. Sure. We need to be very clear about that. It is not about uh, in, in, uh, religion. Oh, give me a break. It is not about a, a, a people. It is about the same blood-sucking, avaricious, controlling, demonic, uh, 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 folks in power that just like we have in the United States and you know it's, it's, it's no coincidence that drone man Barack Obama in reality and the apartheid and I deliberately use the word the apartheid Zionist state of Israel work hand in hand let's understand that and of course we must recognize if they were a religious state in any way shape or form they would not be doing this to their fellow human beings how could they how could they absolutely they would not be doing that to their fellow human beings but unfortunately and this is where our job comes in they uh do not look at other folks as being human beings hmm. which says what about them hmm big question mark what are your thoughts on the revelations of Edward Snowden about the NSA spying program? I think that Edward Snowden is probably, for lack of another terminology, uh, the 21st century hero, for lack of another word, uh, uh, one of the biggest, I won't say the biggest, I don't know what's biggest, smallest, but certainly one of the biggest heroes, not only of the United States, but of the entire world. And... I, I, I salute him, I, I give him kudos, and, you know, that is yet another thing that gives uh, me hope. And let's remember people like today, Jeffrey Sterling, who happens to be a black American, former CIA, uh, who they sentenced him for daring to speak truth to power and expose what the government was doing. But getting back to Snowden, I salute him, and I salute his courage and his integrity, and we need all oh, about 10,000 more Edward mm. Snowden. Because mm. he certainly did uh, put a lot at risk by standing up and exposing this. Absolutely. But he made a personal uh, uh, choice. He made a principled choice. Principled. And for this, I salute him. Wow. Well, Mr. Pinkney, we're definitely going to have to have you back on the show again. I think that I've still got a dozen or so questions I still want to ask, uh, but we'll wrap it up for now. Um, you've been listening to the People Speak Radio Show with special guest Larry Pinkney. I'd like to thank him and remind all the listeners to visit his website at www.blackactivistwg.org or listen to him on the archives at the YouTube channel called UWS United We Strike. Thanks so much for being on the show today, Mr. Larry Pinkney. Thank you, brother. It has been a fantastic. It has been wonderful. And not only do I thank you uh, and the producer and the technician, but I first and foremost want to say, as we said back in the day, all power to the people. 
thank you to the audience. Right on. Uh, join us coming up soon with, on the People Who Speak radio show when I talk with political artist David Dees and esteemed researcher Rick Earthplay. Stay tuned for those interviews coming soon. Big thanks go out to the producers Mike and Donald, to all my friends throughout the world, and all the guys who have given so much support to the show. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. You can tune into my own channel on YouTube called Stop Funding Israel. But for now, take care and bye until next time. One bright sunny morning. Horrible or good, however you want to put it, job of keeping that information away from people. My case, yes, I self-authored it. I did not go through a lawyer. Everyone, or virtually everyone, told me, you're crazy. Uh, your case will never be accepted by the UN. Well, I remembered what Brother Malcolm had said to me well over a decade earlier. And he said, you know what? The struggle uh, for human rights is an international struggle. So we need to take it internationally. So I'm, I'm honored. I'm delighted uh, that I, I, I did that. And even though, of course, I ultimately won, in quotation marks, in other words, I received a ruling from the United Nations Human Rights uh, Committee, which consisted, consisted of many, many countries, uh, stating that indeed my human rights had been violated, both the U.S. and Canada simply ignored uh, the decision. But other countries around the world uh, whether it was in France, Denmark, Germany, Ghana, Tanzania, uh, Jamaica, Ghana, et cetera, et cetera. I think I mentioned Ghana before. But the point is that I'm making is that countries and peoples around the world understood the significance of that for everyday, ordinary people. You don't have to be a lawyer to know anything about human rights. And I want to make that clear. Mm. Uh, your own personal fight for human rights across the board has seen you speak out, not only for your own rights and the rights of African Americans, but the, for the rights of indigenous Americans' rights also. How much work have you done with indigenous Americans in the past? Well, let me begin by saying that my grandmother, uh, my mother's mother, is indigenous. Right. And uh, I, I have a deep and abiding bond with uh, indigenous peoples, uh, particularly those in the so-called United States. I say so-called because, quite frankly, I hate that term Native American. It's like, excuse me, before Americo Vespucci was even born or even thought of being born, indigenous peoples uh, were all over the two continents that have become named North America and South America. Um, so, so my point that I'm trying to make quickly is that uh, indigenous people uh, and myself, and I consider myself not only a quote-unquote black American, but I'm very proud to be, uh, to have the blood in my veins of indigenous native people. And no, I did not say native American, because those people, our people, existed long before there was any such thing called America. Absolutely. Very, very good point there. You know, in Australia, they call the indigenous people, uh, they call them aboriginals, but I deny that term. I don't think they're aboriginals. I think they are the originals. Mm. Mm. I like that, brother. That's a, I like that. Yeah, they, they've, they've got us brainwashed that they're not the originals by saying the word aboriginals. Mm. Very good point. I love it. Because... You know, we need to be critical thinkers. We need to understand that these terms and terminology, the narrative is a narrative meant to control and to define how we think for those few of us who, in fact, Welcome back, Forum. Great to have your company once again. Here's my latest interview from bbsradio.com, an interview with former Black Panther Larry Pinckney. And he's a, a political commentator and a very well-respected man who knows a thing or two about what's happening with our political system. In this interview, he exposes the war criminal Obama, the drone king. 
Here we go with a fascinating interview. Hope you enjoy this just as much as I do. Welcome back, everybody, to the People Speak Radio Show. I'm your host for tonight, Steve Johnson. The People Speak Show normally airs every Tuesday from 6 to 7 Pacific and 9 to 10 p.m. Eastern on the BBS Radio Network. You can participate during the show with call-in questions for our guests toll-free in the United States and Canada on 1-888-429-5471. That number again, 1-888-429-5471. Well, this is a fantastic show tonight. We're talking to a very special guest here, a regular guest on the long-running radio show hosted by Phil Restino called United We Strike. He's a well-known American researcher, a prolific writer, an outspoken advocate of human rights, and a renowned political commentator. We're talking tonight to Mr. Larry Pinckney about the political ties and machinations surrounding the Obama administration and its implications for the people of America. Welcome to the People Speak Radio Show, Mr. Pinckney, sir. Thank you. It is an honor and a delight to be on the People Speak Radio Show. Thank you, my brother. Well, thank you, sir. The honor is truly all ours. Uh, we'll be taking audience questions after the first half hour, but my first question to you, Mr. Pinckney, is, is how long have you been fighting for human rights in America, and how did you get started? Well, I got started at the age of, uh, hmm, I guess I was 11 or 12 years old when I had the opportunity to meet uh, Brother Malcolm X uh, in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, and even though I was extremely young, I read a lot and studied a lot. And uh, this brother touched my heart. Uh, and uh, years later, approximately, oh, five or six years later, I found myself in California and ultimately became a section leader in the Black Panther Party. So, you know, people do have an impact. They definitely do, and I guess that's how I was started. And let me just say, I've been in the struggle now, the people's struggle, uh, and, and I love being on the People Speak Radio, the people's struggle for well over 47 years. The struggle continues. Wow, so you're a long-termer at this sort of thing. Well, <laughs> that's one way of putting it. Absolutely, absolutely, my brother. Uh, you are indeed the only American ever to have successfully self-authored your own civil and political rights case to the United Nations under International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Can you elaborate on the significance of that and what it means for everyday people who are having their rights abused today? What it means, uh, frankly, is that there is international legal pre precedent. Again, I repeat, international legal precedent uh, that addresses quite frankly, uh, matters relating to human rights. And, and people, unfortunately, especially in the United States, are not cognizant of this. They don't understand simply because the corporate government, if you will, uh, has done a, a, a poor, are still thinking. But I think it's mm -hmm. increasing. More and more people are finally beginning to think but I love what you just said. It makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. You know, in the past, you've written a lot of a lot of massive uh, articles on government treason against the people. As an associate editor on the IntrepidReport.com, as well as the Black Commentator, what kind of support and responses have you gotten from your work over the years? Well, initially, back uh, you know, let's go back to 2007, 2008. It's now 2015. But let's go back uh, a few years. You know, the responses overwhelmingly were positive because people were shocked that I dared to write the truth. The truth about uh, the Obamatron, that is to say, Mr. Hope and Change, who was really Mr. Rope and Change, <laughs> not Hope. All right. I mean, really, let's be honest. And I went into who this character really is, who he really serves. And uh, the responses I got overwhelmingly were positive. Of course, I got some responses uh, from readers that said, how dare you? How could you, how could you tell the truth? Well, they didn't say tell the truth. How could you give this information about that brother? Well, my brothers and my sisters are those on Mother Earth who are the stewards of this planet. They are not those who are bloodsuckers. So I don't judge people based on their pigmentation, or what I call the pigmentoid mentality. Right. So I, I got a number of responses, 
but I just wanted to be very succinct and let you know. Most of the responses were extremely positive. People were shocked. 